amen to all women called the good. It was a day that was very hectic to say the least for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that when Jesus died, he temporarily gave his body to Joseph of Arimathea to bury. When Jesus died, he gave his mother Mary to John to look after him. The rest of her life. But when Jesus died, he gave you and I over 60 death benefits written in the Word of God. Forgiveness of our sins, grace, mercy. I could go on and on. I won't name all 60. You look them up. But you know, death benefits are like an insurance policy. Most of us have insurance policies. Broken rooted with us, their betting we're going to live, we bet we're going to die. Seems something wrong with that, doesn't it? But Jesus Christ went to the cross, and Scripture says in Hebrews 12, 2, he went with joy because he knew the death benefits that he was given. Today we want to celebrate that. Today we want to remember that. Today we want to honor our Lord and Savior for the sacrifice that he has shared with us. Let's pray, shall we, as we begin this service. Our Lord and our God, we thank you this day, this Good Friday, that commemorates you being up all night, mocked, scourged, made fun of, your beard was plucked, you were spat upon. You were called names. You were smacked about in the head and then asked to prophesy who did you. You were beaten 39 times with a cat of nine tails until your back was lacerated and left open. And then you were marched half comatose to the place called the Skull. And there in Golgotha, you were impaled upon a cross and you were lifted up for all the world to see. And you died as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Today we gather together as a community and we honor you and we remember your work on the cross for us. You died once for all. We celebrate that today. In Christ's name we pray. Would you stand as you are able and join me in our opening hymn? I will sing of my Redeemer hymn 309.
easier than him. The perverse. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him also. Coming up to him, offering him vinegar and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above him, there was an inscription. This is the king of the Jews. I just want to take a moment before I get into what I want to say. My name is Father Tom Schmidt, and I'm at St. Barnabas and St. Mary's. And the other thing I want to share with you So my first language was sign. A sign before I spoke. And I'm going to share a little bit of that with you tonight. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus, in that very statement, from the cross is teaching us how we are to treat those that perhaps offend us. And he gives us a beautiful anchor of faith and sign. It's like this. It starts intellectually. And then it comes down like this. <laughs> anchor of faith. And so the anchor, the anchor of faith that is given to us by Jesus is that he makes an excuse for those who offend him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What a magnificent anchor for us, is it not? In front of you, you see a copy of, a, a small portion of a copy of Rembrandt's painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And you see that light in his face that Rembrandt and his genius painted, that is this. That means forgiveness, right? Forgiveness, right? And so here is the father with his son, representing, of course, God the Father, with his son there. And we know he's not in this picture, but if I had the full picture, the elder son is actually. In the picture, he takes artistic license and puts them in the house. And nobody wasn't there, but he puts them in the house because the only son has a life in his face. Forgiveness, he's offering it to But even in that picture, there's the only son. All right. Well, what is the excuse that he makes for his son? Your brother was dead, and he's alive, and we're going to celebrate that. See, it's the pieces. And the party goes on, with or without him. Fine. And so there is that. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Forgiveness. A clean slate for his son completely. Father and son. St. Stephen, our first martyr in our church. And what does St. Stephen say before he dies? He says, Father, please forgive my execution. We can read all kinds of stories in the scriptures and we can 
and reflect on them, but, but where it's very important, how have we anchored it in our heart? I'll give you only one example tonight. It's going to be very personal, and I think many people have experienced this. I can't stand to have people come right up to my bumper and they're going very, very fast. I used to get very angry. But I learned. The Father was saying, pay attention. He's giving me an excuse. Pay attention to that driver. And ever since I've done so, once in a while, they come up to me, and we're, we're sitting side by side at a light. And without them sensing it, I look over very nonchalantly, and I see the anxiety their face. Are they going because someone had died? Are they, they just had a fight with someone? I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. I say a prayer for you. Because remember the anger is in our faith. Make an excuse. And do something good for that person. Or well, you don't want to have him. Take one more look at that picture. Again, the brilliance of Rembrandt, which is a sad part to that. You saw the whole picture. All the people in that picture are the faces of Rembrandt at various stages of his life. Isn't that fascinating? And here he was in the senior part of his life. As a matter of fact, he was near death. And he wasn't able to paint the forgiveness of the Father in his own face. <laughs>
there was hurting and abusing and saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do not even fear God. Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what you deserve, what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you are in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Thank you, Sandy. I'm Reverend Steve Wills from the Shepherd Presbyterian Church. Appreciate Sandy and her continued ministries there. Well, we're here to talk about the seven last words of Jesus. But before we get there, the words that I've been asked to preach on, we need to take a picture, a panorama of what we see. On the skull, they look out off. We see not one, but three crosses there. In the middle cross is that of our Lord and Savior Jesus. As eloquently described in Jesus' opening prayer, the persecution, the tragedy that he went through the night, throughout the morning. And on his two sides were criminals, thieves. Persecuted by the Roman government for their sin. They were there paying due process because they were guilty. And on the left, we have, we'll name him Criminal One. Okay? Criminal One over here. He was filled with God, he was angry. He knew he had been a criminal. And he held that anger within, unable to seek repentance or forgiveness, and was there being crucified because he was guilty. And then over on this side, on the right side, there was another criminal, and we'll call him Steve. Why? Because he's turned his face. Yeah, he was guilty. Yeah, he had done wrong. Yeah, he was just as guilty as criminal one. But Steve turned his face and realized he was a sinner. He realized his guilty. And he said to the Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. These two sinners revealed who Jesus revealed what Jesus was come to do. For you see, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Isn't that true? Whose name is here on the cross? Is it Steve's? It is. For all the sinners fall short of the glory of God. We've all rebelled. We all deserve. That's the first issue that we need to look at. The whole purpose of today is to do just that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The purpose, the whole ministry from creation on, from when we read in Genesis when it said that the, that the serpent's head would be crushed, it all pointed to the cross of Calvary. All 600 prophecies of the Old Testament pointed right to the cross. The second issue that we want to talk about, many of you know I have four beautiful daughters. Many years ago, when I was a little more rambunctious in my preaching, I was preaching on coming down, come on down, little revivalist. In me. Just like the price is right. Come on now. It's time. One of my precious girls, her. 
She jumped out of the pew and come on down. She ran down the boat for us. What was I to do? I was right in the middle of my sermon. What was I to do? What would a good pastor do? He'd do just this. My little girl. Help her. Help her. Kept her going. Here Jesus is. Paying the price for the world. His whole mission was being taken place right there on the cross. He was there as prophecies revealed. The goal of his mission in life. He said it over and over again. I come to save sinners. My purpose in being here is to be on the cross. And what does he do? He goes to that one sinner named Steve or and says, Today you'll be with me in paradise. He took time out of his massive ministry to talk to the one.
So the soldiers did this, the standing by the cross of Jesus, for his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. What a beautiful, glorious gathering of God's children. Amen? Amen. Keith, as we uh, gathered this morning uh, to get ready uh, for the service, uh, reminded us that uh, although some of us might think that uh, others of us won't be in heaven uh, someday, we are all going to be together because we are all family. Y'all know how family works. Uh, as we look around town, we probably think of some of our churches as, you know, like our stodgy grandpa or our wild nephew who's gone astray or, or that cousin who we really don't want to claim as being part of our family, but uh, because of what Jesus did on this day, because of his blood binding us, we are all family. We do have this weird thing going on in our culture where we're ultra competitive. And that spills over into our life as Christians, and we see our, our churches as, as being in competition with one another. But I don't think that needs to be so. And today is a day where we put that aside and say that no, we are all on the same team and we all are family. For us Protestants, I don't think we give enough time or credit to Mary Keith. I will say we did miss by not having our brother Father Tom do a little work on Mary this morning for. Uh, the rest of us Protestants gather here, but she really is a remarkable person of faith, an available servant of God, and a model of faithfulness for the church universal. How did she get to the foot of the cross that day? How did she find herself watching her son die an agonizing death? She responded to a call from God. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to visit young Mary who resides in Galilee in a town called Nazareth. You might remember Gabriel's opening line is, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Mary's uncertain of what is happening and the angel reassures her, Do not be afraid. Gabriel goes on to describe what's about to happen. She will birth Jesus, the Son of the Most High. Mary, of course, wonders how this can be. The angel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary says, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Mary said, here am I. This is how she ended up at the foot of the cross that day. She said yes when God asked her to do something. Mary comes from a long line of folks who said yes when God came to call them. Abraham responded to God by being deemed faithful and saying, Here I am. Jacob responded to God in a dream with the phrase, Here I am. Moses responds to God out of the burning bush with the phrase, Can you say it? Here I am. Samuel, in accepting his call to priesthood, responds with God, Here I am. Isaiah, caught up in a vision of God in the temple, Responds to God's question of who he should send with, here I am, send me. And Mary says, here am I, servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Responding with, here I am, led her to birthing the Savior of the world. Here I am, led her to the foot of the cross that day. Here I am, led her to becoming one of the first disciples one of the founding members of the church that we know it. I thought about that song. Does anybody know that? I know you're already thinking about this, right? You know that song, Here I Am? Us Methodists aren't known for spontaneity, but I thought we might try something here. I would probably go into it, okay? We were known for potlucks, obviously, but uh, not as much spontaneity. So can we give this a go? You guys know this song, Here I Am, Lord? I'll talk to the words because I'm, I'm willing to be a fool for Jesus in public, but not seeing in public. There is a limit to my foolishness. So let's try this, shall we? I need some help from our singers. Here I am.
beloved disciple, is married full of hope, with our brothers and sisters across many churches here in Piqua. And hear Jesus say to all of us, These are your brothers. These are your sisters. This is your family. God, we thank you for this day, for the blood that's been spilled to bind us together. And God, in this moment, in the name of your Son, Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of spiritual competitiveness here in our town of Pigwa. Might we see ourselves as family. Cheer us on, cheer each other on as we do good. Lift us up when we're feeling down. And more than anything, might this collection of people representing many churches in our town be a reflection of your light and your love, so that those outside these walls who desperately need to hear a word from you might hear it because we say, Here I am. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you see as you're able and join me in singing M302, Lamb of God.
until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, the of Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus was uh, entering uh, Jerusalem, what we now call the beginning of Holy Week, uh, when Jesus was entering, before that, he shared with his disciples that the Son of Man uh, is going to be betrayed. Uh, he's going to be handed over by the chief priests and the scribes to the Gentiles and that he will be crucified. But he added this, and on the third day, did everybody say that? On the third day. On the third day, he will rise again. Now, there's been much debate about uh, what Jesus was thinking or feeling when he, when he uttered the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some say that he was actually quoting Psalm 22 in the first verse. That is a, a scary and accurate prediction of the future Messiah's suffering. I can't say for sure what Jesus was thinking or feeling. But I can say for sure I have felt forsaken by God. Now the scripture said that it was dark, and it should have been light because it was new, but it, it, it became dark for about three hours. And sometimes in our lives we enter a dark time, a difficult time. We enter a time uh, of trouble, trial, and sometimes even tragedy. And in those times, it's quiet as a step. Some of us think in our hearts if we don't proclaim it with our mouths. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because when you're in the middle of something, most people don't talk about the middle. We talk about the beginning and we talk about the glorious end, but we don't talk about the messy middle. That place when it doesn't look like anything's going to come to pass like God said it. That place when it seems like maybe God has been unfaithful. That, that thing that God does by doing things His own way in His own time. You know that. When we expect it by now, He will come through. We expect it by now, it will look differently. But when it doesn't look anything like we thought it would, in that darkness is the time when you've got to think about your third day. Because see, it's the third day that you know about before you get on the cross that gives you the strength to endure. The salt book in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, actually said that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the shame of the cross, and now is seated at the right hand of God. That means the endurance came from setting his focus on the joy that was set before you. So when you are in the middle of your dark day, it's not the time to start to doubt. It's not the time to start to fear. It's the time to look at the joy set before you, knowing that our God is faithful, that your God is true to his word. And no matter what you're dealing with right now, what you're going through right now, what you're struggling with right now, I assure you, there is a resurrection. There is a resurrection. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for sending your Son for us. To die for us and to rise again, that we can have life eternal. We also thank you for the promise that you never leave us and you never forsake us. I pray for those who have gathered today, Father, who are going through struggles, maybe the loss of loved ones, maybe a struggle in finances or relationships. I pray now that you would reveal to them that the light will shine again and that your faithfulness is true and that their resurrection is not. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. <laughs>
believe it. <laughs> John 19 28 says after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. The Romans were very good at a lot of things. They built amazing roads. They built, they built roads through that, that made travel all through the different uh, regions of their empire possible so that commerce could happen. They, they built uh, sewage systems that are still in use today in Rome. Uh, even back then. But one of the things that they were really amazing at doing was killing people. They had a real penchant for inflicting pain on people who were not their citizens. They were considered less than or outside of their reality. And I would love to spend some time on people that we consider less than or outside of our reality, but that will have to wait for another time. But they really knew how to kill people. They knew how to inflict pain. And one of the things that they learned is all the people that they had crucified, and this, this is kind of inside baseball, okay? We're going to kind of get in the weeds here for just a second, if you don't mind. But when a person was being crucified, they learned that if you gave them water to drink, that it actually would cause them to slip into sleep and coma, and it was actually merciful to do that. Mm. Very odd thing, isn't it? It's a very odd thing, but that's one of the things that they learned. And I don't know whether giving water to Jesus would have been an act of kindness or not. I do know that another act of kindness had already been offered to Jesus. If you go back to Matthew 27, 34, it said they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And the reason he didn't want to drink it then is because he didn't want to be stupefied. He didn't want to be dumbed down. He didn't want to be numbed because he wanted to be fully aware of what it was that he was doing for you and for me. He wanted the full weight of everything on his shoulders. Crushing him. But he didn't just die for our salvation. I mean, I wish that we could say that the only purpose for Jesus' death on the cross was so that we could be saved. But in Romans, it says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage and decay and will attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross was setting in place a cosmological Shift that would put things right again. Because things needed to be made right again. Just a few days before Jesus is on the cross, actually the night before Jesus is on the cross, uh, we see Peter. I, I love Peter. You know, Peter's, Peter's every dude. In America, okay? In the world. I mean, Peter's just that. And and we see Peter, and and they come to arrest Jesus, and, and Peter, and I don't, I've never in the Bible, any other place, but I see that they had swords. Right? I mean, the disciples, I didn't think they ran around with swords strapped to them. But, but they come in to arrest Jesus, and see, what? <laughs> And here, he rips the guy's ear off with the sword and flips off on the ground. And, and Jesus is like, oh. <laughs> And he puts it back on. 
And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, put your sword back in its sheath. And I'm not to drink the cup that the Father has given me. So we go back to John 19, 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scriptures, I'm thirsty. You see, he couldn't drink before. But he is now done what he came to do. It's done. It's completed. And he says, I'm thirsty. If you want to give me water, give it to me now. I don't know how big a part thirst played in the death of Jesus Christ on a physical level. But I know that he didn't die from a lack of drinking. Because he took the cup that God gave him and he turned it up. And he did not stop until that cup was finished. Holy God, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the power of the gospel. Thank you for the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, as hard as it is to say those words. Because out of that death springs hope for all of us, even the whole cosmos. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Now, there was a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and they put it upon hyssop, and put it in his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So that maybe 
maybe, just maybe, when it's all done and fixed, we can say and we can look back, it is finished. Charles Woodfall said, uh, people ask me when I'm going to retire. He's in the same age group that I'm in. And he said, I don't know that I'm ever going to retire. And I hope that the Lord says something to me right now. And he, if he calls me home, I hope it's in the pulpit. And my head hits the pulpit as I'm falling down. <laughs> See, he knows what it's about. He knows that we're talking about our life and what we are doing and what he's called us to do. He says it is finished. That word is a single word, not, not three words. It is that word that talks about, and I probably will not pronounce it right, tek tek ladeste, which means it is finished. I only need one word to say the whole thing. And in your life and my life, what are we doing and how are we going to live it forever and forever in Jesus Christ if, if we give ourselves to Him and allow Him to forgive us of all of our sins. You see, that's what it's about. There are no more sacrifices that need to be made. That's what he was saying. The sacrifices are done this day forever. And he died, but he came back in three days. To show that it was done and to teach them and to teach us that he really meant that he wanted us to come and to be his children as we give our lives to him. And I wonder sometimes as uh, we look out at our, our congregations and the people that we talk to, you know, Jerry accepted Jesus Christ that day. He went on to live a few more days. But his son was so glad that he knows Jesus Christ and here's the guy that waited until the 11th hour. And in his funeral, I said, I know that some of you all are going to think you can wait till the 11th hour also. But it may be 10.30 when he calls. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying to you? God wants us to give our life to him, huh? And to that we could really say that I have done the best that I can do. Paul said these words. If I could turn this over, I'll tell you. Paul says these words, I have fought the good faith. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. He had done a good job. I wonder if we're here on this afternoon, if there are persons here that have some unfinished business. Because that's what we preachers are about. Or at least we should be. Bringing people into a relationship with Jesus Christ and letting everything that we could be able to say it is. He said, as he lifted his head, It is finished! Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you paid such a price for us. Help us to not forget that you want us to come to you. And in our hearts this moment, we can do that. We would allow you to say something to us in your heart and our heart. In Jesus' name, it is finished. Amen. <laughs> would you stand and join me in singing near the cross in 319? <laughs>
by this time, it was noon. Darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. And suddenly the thick veil hanging in the temple was torn apart. Then Jesus shouted, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with those words, he breathed his last. When a captain of the Roman soldiers handling the executions saw what had happened, he praised God and said, Surely this man was a righteous man. And when the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw all that had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. As we have heard over the last hour and a half, may God add his blessings to his word to our lives. <clears throat> Friends, the most explosive event in human history was finished. And for most of the world, it passed like a fizzled out firecracker. No spark, no back. An event that God had prepared for for eternity and had made known since the Garden of Eden when he told the serpent that there would be a day when the Son of Man would bruise his head. Since that time, but make no, make no, what was accomplished on the cross was an eternal transaction between the Father and the Son. Jesus didn't die a martyr who failed his cause. Jesus was more than just a good man with an example of how to live. No, 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 this day, this day was a planned moment. Peter, in his great sermon on Pentecost, said that Jesus was delivered up by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Isaiah 53 makes it abundantly clear that Jesus did not for his own sins because he didn't have any. But he died for ours. Interesting sidetrack. I think a couple of you kind of mentioned them and hinted it just a little bit. In Jeremiah 25, God talks of the day when he will make all nations drink of the cup of his wrath. But could that have been the cup that Jesus was talking about when he said, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not thy, my will, but thine be done? Hmm. He knew the horrors of the cup of wrath for eternity past, one with the Father. He saw the sins of the people. He knew what must be done for them. And he knew the horrors. He knew the punishment that it would take the punishment that the whole world deserved. If that cup of wrath was his to take, he was going to have to take that. Nevertheless, he said, not my will, but mine be done. And he took what you and I deserved. You know, Max O'Keefe summed it up quite well when he said, Jesus settled the question. He would rather go to hell for you than to go to heaven without you. And that's what he did. That was the cup he took. He knew the wrath. But now, now it's almost over. The words, it is finished, have been spoken. Now with one more deep painful breath. He lets out a cry, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <laughs> Interesting to note as I was looking this up, almost all the commentators mentioned this was a prayer that 
almost every good Jewish boy and girl prayed every night, kind of like you teach your prayer to your children, now I lay me down to sleep, etc. They would pray out of Psalm 31 5, a prayer of David, into your hands. I commit my spirit. Jesus had to do that cry of one word Father, Father, into your hands. Can you imagine that someday, someday you and I will commit our spirit into the Father's hands? Because of Jesus, someday we will know. Because of Jesus, the work of salvation is done and is finished. Because of Jesus, we have a future. Because of Jesus, we don't have just a hope. We have a promise. Mm. Peter was there. He saw it all. And he wrote in his, in his letter in 1 Peter. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. We've been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. Listen to me. Listen to me. He's talking to you to an inheritance. Incorruptible undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Father, in your hands, we commit our spirits. Amen. As the time choir comes forward, it's as you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. In the picture, you're sitting before, you're standing before the foot of the cross. You see Jesus hanging up there, taking in that last breath, and slowly breathing it out. The ultimate sacrifice has been paid for you and for me.
You know, uh, when I was asked to do the benediction, I was kind of curious just what the word actually meant. So I looked it up. I found out it was defined as a bestowing or an uttering of a blessing upon a congregation, especially at the end of a religious service. And as I sat down here and listened to the words and heart of our brothers and sisters of God's body, I couldn't help but to hear those cries of our Savior. I couldn't help but to have in my mind witnessing his suffering, pain, and death. And I wondered to myself, how can one receive blessings from such an experience? Yet I realize it's not enough just to know what happened on Good Friday, or how important we know why it happened, or even who it was meant for. For the truth is, it happened for us. The blessing that is God clothed himself in Jesus and took our place. Christ died and did it for you and for me. He took our death and our sin and lovingly suffered so that we don't have to. He died so we know how to find a way home again to heaven. He rose from the death and the grave so that we can live a victorious life through Him. How blessed are we. Let us pray. Lord, as we leave here, watch over us and protect us. Let our hearts rejoice knowing your blessings are here and were given to us freely. Let us never forget what you've done for us. And let us pick up your cross and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. I am honored to introduce what's coming up next. And that is the tolling of the bells. The bell will be tolled 33 times in all. She represents each year that our Savior walked among men to prepare us for such a great sacrifice. May the sound of this bell touch not only your ears, but may it touch your heart. So please be remain seated until the bell has finished ringing. Then when it is over, be quietly and reverently.